Should we censor the Hitlers of the world? Extreme cases always test our commitment to a free society. Free society depends on a lot of optimistic assumptions. One of them is our general confidence in the power of reason. That people have intelligence and good judgment, enough of it to handle the cognitive demands of living freely. They don't need mommy and daddy or a big government to tell them what to do and how to live their lives. Another important dependency is our confidence in human decency. People are honorable enough, good enough for us to trust them with lots and lots of freedom. They don't need to be caged like wild animals that can't be trusted. Also, a liberal society depends on our confidence in human competence. People are, in practice, capable of running their own lives and uh, able to overcome its problems and its, its challenges. So this is why dramatic examples of human ignorance, bad judgment, uh, human depravity, kind of sheer patheticness and incompetence they strike hard against our liberal commitments. Our, our reaction is uh, to become illiberal or to entertain illiberal reactions. We call for the censorship of ideas that we think people can't handle. We get disgusted and we want to eliminate temptations that we think people can't handle. Or we call paternalistically for father figures or mother figures to take control of this or that aspect of people's lives. So these censor, ban, paternalism impulses, they're constants in our social debates because there really is a never-ending stream of examples of bad mistakes, immoralities, and incompetencies. So how do we, though, on principle, right, as a matter of policy, as a matter of uh, philosophical commitment, decide whether we're going to be liberal or whether we're going to remove liberal rights in varying degrees? Now, extreme cases like uh, the case of Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists, right, it's no accident that we always return to them everywhere around the world. They loom large in our thinking, as does the steady stream of mini Hitlers and Hitler wannabes of various sorts in all walks of life and again, all over the world. Our current concerns are uh, the new generation of social media, social unrest, triggers, inflammatory languages and images. This has led some of the social media giants who are wrestling with precisely this problem, YouTube, Twitter, Google, Patreon, and the others, to consciously deplatform individuals that they judge to be beyond the pale of civil discourse. It's also led to a new problem uh, given their use of algorithms to filter out undesirable content, the uh, automated, semi-unintended blocking of legitimate historical and political information. You know, some uh, history teachers, for example, have found their online course lessons on German history blocked because they contain archival footage of Hitler giving a speech or a Nazi parade or something like that. Of course, those uh, unintended consequences, they can be avoided in the future, uh, just improve the algorithms. And it still leaves us with the need to make a principled decision about how to handle the actual extreme cases where there's obnoxious, false, hateful, destructive, otherwise terrible ideas are actually being advocated. So as a working example, let's take uh, the case of Adolf Hitler's 1925 book, Mein Kampf, and the German authorities' decision to allow its republication. World War II ended in 1945. With the defeat of the Nazis for many decades, the book was censored in Germany, but it's now again available. Was that a good decision or a uh, bad decision? Now, decent people, we can make the argument that the book is just too dangerous to be published. And my view is the exact opposite. Mein Kampf is a dangerous book, but it's too dangerous not to be published. Dangerous ideas should always be allowed so that they can be confronted openly. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. That's a beautiful cliche, and it's absolutely true. And we are smart enough, we are decent enough to keep bad ideas confined to a minority and keep them on the defensive, but only if we are allowed to know them and to confront them. Of course, the great fear is that Hitler's ideas are far from dead and that his book could trigger right, another horribly pathological social movement. Nationalism and socialism appeal to many people, and combinations of the two ideologies, national socialism, they attract new adherents every day in Europe 
and around the world. And I'll just as a sidebar, invite you to uh, keep an eye out for my forthcoming podcast entitled Neo-Nazi and Neo-Fascist in Europe. They're not just racists. But uh, Mein Kampf is available in many editions, in many languages, and online. Just did a quick search at Amazon, and it shows three different translations are available in English. It's available in hardcover, softcover, ebook, and audiobook. And apparently many thousands of English-speaking people are buying the book regularly. So part of the furor over its republication does seem to be about the Germans in particular. Maybe there's an ethnic subtext at work here. Do we think the Germans can handle it given their history? Uh, one of many old jokes has one German ask another, how many poles does it take to change a light bulb? And the other German ap- replies, oh, I don't know. Let's invade Poland and find out. It's always fun to poke at the German's historical reputation. But joking aside, there has been you know, three generations since the end of World War II. There have been major cultural shifts in the German attitudes toward militarism, authoritarianism, anti-Semitism, and the other elements in the National Socialist package. There's also plenty of evidence that today's Germans are kind of well above the world average in civility and decency. So at a minimum, I think the post-Nazi cultural training wheels can come off and we can treat the Germans like fully-fledged citizens of the world. But beyond the specifics of the German debate, there is a more important general point that we should insist on about prohibiting even the most repulsive of ideas. Censorship weakens our ability to combat them. It leaves us in ignorance. It drives the movements underground. There's always going to be some subgroup that we are worried about, whether it's Marxist revolutionaries, Islamist jihadists, militant fascists, and equally militant anti-fascists, so on and so on and so forth. Our worries about them are going to always provoke censor and suppress responses, but the bigger danger is our own ignorance of what those groups think and want, and consequently our ignorance-based disability to respond to them appropriately. So let's go back to the Nazis and Hitler's book in particular. Understandably, Levi Solomon, uh, speaking for the Jewish Forum for Democracy and Against Anti-Semitism, it's a group based in Berlin, he opposed the republication of Mein Kampf, and he said, here's a direct quote, this book is outside of human logic, unquote. Now, perhaps that's true, but The book is not outside of human experience, and we have to understand the logic of national socialist beliefs, putting logic in scare quotes if you want, however illogical those ideas turn out to believe. Those beliefs continue to have powerful psychological and social appeal to many people. So it's crucial that every generation know exactly what they are, why they attract so many people, and how to fight them. So, philosophical, political, and historical education is a must for every generation. And when we start to look, we can't just dismiss them as some crazy guys who just somehow lucked into power. For too long, a cartoonish understanding of National Socialism has held sway in the public mind, and that is part of our disarming ourselves. So, against that, let's do a little bit of intellectual history on the Nazis and why it's important to, to read their works. For years before the Nazis took over, three Nobel Prize winners, for example, Johannes Stark, Gerhard Hauptmann, Philippe Lenard, they supported the Nazis. These are not stupid guys. Also, before the Nazis came to power, many intellectuals with PhD degrees from the best German universities wrote books supporting and contributing to national socialist ideology. Among them were the historian Dr. Oswald Spengler, who published the best-selling Decline of the West in 1918. Spengler was probably the most famous German intellectual in the 1920s. We should also mention the legal theorist Dr. Carl Schmidt, who wrote books that are still recognized as 20th century classics. The political theorist Moller Vandenbroek published 
The book is 1923, remember, The Third Reich. It was a bestseller throughout the 1920s. The philosopher, Dr. Martin Heidegger, to this day, many think of him as the most original philosophical mind of the century, but he actively supported the Nazis in theory and in practice. So the problem here is not Adolf Hitler alone. The problem is not one book alone. And if we're going to censor the dangerous writings that led to Nazism, the list really is very long. It's also important to remember that many millions of Germans voted for the Nazi party. In the critical democratic election of 1933, the Nazis won 43% of the vote. That's more than the next three parties combined. This says lots about the political intellectual climate of the time. Most popular party, National Socialism. Second most popular party, Socialism. Third most popular party, Communism. And jumping to our own generation and speaking directly to any fans of democratic socialism in our times, please, please do consider that the world has experienced democratic national socialism. The Nazis were voted into power, and that's what led to the party's leader, Hitler, being appointed chancellor. So the electoral success of the Nazis was not the product of a set of ideas in books alone, and certainly not one guy and one book. In building their movement, the Nazis used cutting edge principles of marketing, logistics, administration. They applied new theories of psychology and sociology. They built a core movement of hundreds of devoted activists, and they turned that into a mass movement of millions of followers. Yet we're not going to censor books on effective logistics, effective marketing, and social psychology. So we have some hard questions here that we have to face up to. Why did so many top intellectuals agree with National Socialist ideas? Censoring them and the ideas of their leaders is not going to help us answering those questions. Why did so many volunteers and donors and professionals devote their energies to creating this awesome, however repulsive, political movement. Why did millions of Germans vote, often enthusiastically, for the Nazis? Were they all just stupid or depraved or insane? No, they were not. Whether we like it or not, National Socialism, it embodies a very deep philosophy of life, and that's exactly what explains its power. You might argue that the Nazi philosophy is not logical, it's not rational. I will agree with you, but few philosophies are. You might also argue that Nazism, if it's embraced fully, will lead to psychosis. I will agree with you again. Yet yeah, that also is true of very many philosophies. I would add Marxism, Islamism, and a long list of other ones. But it's not logical or rational of us or sane to ignore a set of ideas that continues to animate movements around the world. Ignoring and suppressing dangerous ideas is much, much more dangerous than fighting them openly. A free society, it can only work if most of its members understand what the principles of a free society are, what it depends on, and why those are better than the alternatives. That presupposes that they know what the alternatives are, and the only way for them to know what the alternatives are is for those works to be out there in books, now in podcasts, in blogs, discussed in classrooms, video footage available, and so on. We have to know it all. So the point is there are no shortcuts in our ongoing cultural education. Every generation has to discuss, it has to debate the great ideas, the true ones and the false ones, the known things and the possibilities, healthy and dangerous ideas. And it has to become intellectually armed so as to be able to defend and advance liberal civilization. Sometimes the urge to censor focuses on the symbolism right, of allowing evil books to be published, not censoring Mein Kampf, for example, is said then to be a statement by the authorities that they consider national socialist ideas to be within the range of acceptable opinion. But we should always remember that a free society also rejects the idea that it's up to the authorities to decide what opinions are acceptable. 
The job of the government is not to decide the topics of debate and discussion and to put some of things off topic and out of the range of discussion. That's our job for each of us individually. The job of government is to protect our right to debate and discuss anything we want. That's our political right. Our moral responsibility actually then is to enter into the discussion, enter into the debates, become informed, and then in our position as leadership, uh, governing our own lives, becoming parents, becoming teachers, becoming heads of various organizations or managers of various groups to continue the discussion in a way that encourages people to continue to understand and understand the right principles. In his uh, dissenting opinion, in a classic case in American censorship, Justice Potter Stewart made this perceptive remark, quote, censorship reflects a society's lack of confidence in itself, unquote. That's exactly right. There is an important symbolism built into encouraging robust free speech, and that symbolism is this. We can handle it. We can handle any idea that's thrown at us. We have the intelligence, we have the judgment, we have the principles of civility in place to deal with wrong ideas, even dangerous ideas, and to overcome them. So let us strive for that self-confidence. We have the smarts and we have the character to deal with the Adolf Hitler wannabes as well as their clever theoreticians.